What's up, everybody? Welcome to Leaders of Lifestyle, a podcast all about real estate, sports, and entertainment. Take a deep dive with me into the world of high-end lifestyle and get exposed to the different leaders behind the scenes of it all. So let's get right into it. Welcome to Leaders of Lifestyle Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Ferraro, and today's guest is Compass Broker Richard Steinberg. Richard Steinberg is one of New York's most successful and prominent brokers of apartments and townhouses, grossing well over $150 million annually. Richard previously starred on the HGTV television show Selling New York, and he can be seen on American Dream New York, which also airs on WLNY and CBS. Uh, he has a client roster of New York's top celebrities, politicians, business leaders, and developers. Richard, thank you so much for being with us today. Great. My pleasure. It sounds better than I think I am. Really? No, I don't think so. I think that <laughs> I could have kept going, but I tried to try to keep us some time here so we could actually do this podcast because your resume is thank you. substantial. That's very generous of you. <laughs> well, you have had uh, an amazing career that seems to just keep getting better and better. And uh, let's just start off with this question. How have you found the New York City market during these crazy days? Uh, well, I'm glad you said crazy days. It's almost like the Wild West is what I'm finding because everything that you discuss with your buyers and your sellers is pre-COVID or post-COVID. Right. Uh, there's nothing normal about the market the way it is. Comps only go back to, uh, as I said, post-COVID days. That's all buyers and sellers are interested. They're not interested in what happened three or four years ago. It's irrelevant to them. Right. So, um, it, you know, we're charting new territory. Right. And so to outsiders perspective, people who don't uh, work in the city, live in the city, um, commute to the city as much anymore, maybe has businesses there anymore. Um, you know, you hear different things. So the city's going to take a really long time to come back. And even nationally, people look at metropolitan cities and say it's been uh, it's going to be a really long time till it comes back. But the greatest city on earth, New York City, um, and for someone like you, it has been going pretty well. Has there been anything that you've seen changing as far as the marketplace, as far as clientele now that's been you know, during COVID? Yeah, that's a great question. I, um, I, the market is extremely hot. And you know what? I know that that probably is going to make certain people roll their eyes, <laughs> but um, it's, it's hotter than it has been in the past 18 months. People are back in New York. They see that there is an opportunity to still get some good deals. And I think they're jumping on it. The market between two and $5 million is absolutely on fire. Yeah. And we've now seen in the past, I would say 60 to 90 days, the high end market. And when I say high end, I mean apartments $15 million or more right. are actually um, being sold too, especially the new, new development. So there are some really, really big numbers. So um, uh, contrary to what I think probably most people believe uh, we were absolutely dead for uh, March 2020 to March 2021, but we are absolutely back with a vengeance. Now, let me ask you this. I know you started selling real estate back in 1986 as an agent, correct? As a, as a when you Yeah, 86 is when I started. Yeah. So you've seen the 90s, the 2000s, the 2010, 2020, now we're into 2020, 2030. This buyer the times now are people buying in New York City and investing in real in real estate in New York City for different reasons than they did in the past? Um, well, traditionally, obviously, I've been through two or three different periods. I've been through um, when uh, New York City was almost going bankrupt in the 91s and 92s. I saw it through um, uh, the Bear Stearns debacle. Um, you know, Lehman Brothers closing yeah. that debacle. I actually, quite frankly, think this COVID period is quite different. And I think that it people were petrified to buy real estate in New York. Now, what they're realizing is at the end of the day, New York City is the financial capital of the world. It has been for generations and centuries, and it will continue to do so. And I think that you have to understand foreign money is now back, as you know, <clears throat> November 8th, Travelers and foreigners are allowed back into the United States. I think we're going to be an influx of a tremendous amount of buyers. And it's the best way to park. It's, it's a f savings account, f f moving money from an unstable economy to the most stable economy in the world. And that's right. why we're going to see our foreign buyers coming back. We've seen it already. They are starting to come back again. Yeah. The foreign buyer that's buying, do you find that's coming in at a certain price point looking for a certain type of asset? 
there are actually two types of foreign buyers. There's the foreign buyers who either uh, want to rent out these apartments as an investment or they have young children. When I, when I say young children, I shouldn't say that college age children uh, that they want to buy as an investment instead of a dorm. Yeah. Uh, and so that's usually in around the two million dollar mark, slightly two to three million dollars. And then you see. Um, the, the, the heavy investors who are buying um, really new development, very expensive property that's now at a 20, 30 percent discount. Yeah. So would you say, I mean, it, I'm, I'm also seeing that a lot is, is people who are looking at New York City um, for the investment, whereas before it was a permanent residence. I don't know if that's a trend more in some of the lower price points um, as far as the let's say million and a half, two million, uh, three and a half range in apartments or condos in New York City because there was this big drop drop off in rents because of everything that happened. And then it looks like it's all booming back. So the people who purchased during that devaluation time are really making out and it's still some value at those price points, right? Because the, the, the rents are going to keep going right. up and then the foreign money is going to come in. Right. Well, you have to remember that mortgage money is still at basically one of the all time lows. I think you can still get mortgage money for somewhere between 2.75 and maybe three and a quarter percent. Right. Um, the treasury has not raised inflate, you know, interest rates. Um, at the end of the day, if you park your money into a savings account or even in bonds, what are you going to get a 2% return on right. your money? If you're lucky, right? If you're lucky, why not buy an apartment, rent it out? So it covers your costs and you get a slight um, return on your dollar, hold on to it for three to five years and sell it at a profit, which is what I'm advising my investors to do. And we're seeing a tremendous amount of purchases in that one, two bedroom area where they can purchase something at a discount. Developers, remember, have loans that they have to pay back yeah, also. Cost and, and therefore, they're willing to discount these apartments. And we're seeing our investors buying bulks of two, three, five apartments in a bulk, getting a discount, renting them out for three years. And their plan is three years from now, four years from now to sell it at a profit. Gotcha. We hear in my area, single family, more residential, obviously, and more of a place like Greenwich or Westport. Um, we talk a lot about spec building and custom and materials, uh -huh. people trying to buy new constructions. Developers in New York City, um, they obviously have to feel the same crunch when it comes to construction costs and material costs and stuff like that. What's your conversation been like and what is it looking like on the horizon for new development? Well, you know, for the past year, it's been impossible to buy goods, wood, appliances, things of that nature. So we saw in New York City that most of the transactions were in what we call triple min apartments, apartments that didn't need gut renovations, because if they had a timeline of 12 months that it would cost uh, that that it would take to renovate, they're now seeing that's double 24 months just because there's lack of supplies. Right. So <clears throat> our investors are buying mint properties. They're buying things that need no work. But we are seeing that that also is changing. We are seeing that prices are coming down on, on, on a lot of these dry goods, a lot of these construction, asbestos, right. sheetrock, uh, not asbestos, obviously. Uh, I meant sheetrock, uh, dry goods, appliances are now coming back. And um, investors, the, the sweet spot now is really for uh, developers that had finished their product about a year ago. They can offer discounts and still find that they're getting a profit not as great as they had anticipated, you know, 36 months ago, but they can get a profit. I think the toughest spot now is for um, a developer or construction that's, that started up six months ago. There's been delays, there's been setbacks, there's no product. So that's the tough part. So, um, but we're seeing really a lot of investment coming back into New York. Yeah. Remember the Pieta Terre tax in New York was supposed to have been instituted three years ago. It keeps getting delayed by, you know, New York State Assembly. So that uh, there's no uh, prediction when that will come in, if it will come in at all. And if it does, it'll come in in a much abbreviated version. There is a, a resurgence of confidence in New York again. So let me ask you, you're dealing with a high end client, let's say, for example, coming in New York, thinking necessarily, you know, they, they have the ability financially to buy something very special. Maybe it's a, in their mind, maybe they're looking for something for a long term investment, but at the same time, you know, they're thinking they're coming and getting uh, New York City's been slow deal. They're coming in for the first time and they're looking 20 million plus up to about 50 million dollars. So they're looking some some high end stuff. What do you say to them when they say, well, I, I, th this market's way hotter than I thought. And if I buy something right now, I'm never going to be able to sell it back. You know, that whole thing where people say, well, I'm buying it at the height of the market. I can't get a, uh, the market's going to dip back. What do you say to those people at that high end for New York City? Because that's a little different than the suburbs. 
Yeah, New York City is much different. It, New York City is prime for investors. Obviously, the suburbs are less optimum for, for investors. It just doesn't work for an investor. Um, what I say to them is, quite frankly, you have six more months of opportunity. Mm. My prediction is that in six months, prices will be almost back to the way they were pre-COVID. Really? Uh, we just, uh, we're in contract now. Our team is in contract now. Uh, the apartment was originally priced. Um, at over $50 million, and the buyer got it for $38.5 million. Now, I know that that's a ridiculous amount of money, and I, by no means am I trying to, to be uh, presumptuous. You know, it's the 1% of 1% of 1% that can afford it, but that still represents a substantial discount. And there are still $15 million apartments can be bought for $10 million. You know, $10 million apartments can still be bought for $7 million. Now, now, they're hard to find. Don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that that's across the board, but we probably have another six month window where there will absolutely be no no bargains anymore. What's the what, I always equate it to stock markets, the speedboat and the real estate markets, the, the big cruise liner ships. It takes a long time for those things to sh change and shift gears. Why? What happens in six months that we have such a drastic shift? Well, it ha it's been a, it's been happening over the past six months to a year. What I'm so trying to say slow, is everyone uh, ran out of the country a year ago. Mm -hmm. They ran out. March, uh, I, the timeline for me was March 2020, when obviously everything shut down. People left in droves. People were leaving New York City. It was a caravan of people leaving New York City. And now what's happening is over the period of the last six months. So it's not happening. It just didn't happen overnight. It happened in a period of six months. People realized, first of all, if you can afford to live in New York, you, there's no better education for your family. You have the exposure of the museums, New York theater. You have, there's no better place, there's no better quality of life if you can afford it in, than in New York City. And I think people moved out in Exodus to the suburbs where you are and to Florida and to other places. And they realized after six months, you know what? We're, we're city people. We're, we're New York people. And either they didn't sell their apartment, they rented it out if they could afford to do that, or they're now seeing that they want to come back to New York. So I think for the first time, I think it's three months now or four months, more people are coming back into New York than we're leaving. For the past year and a half, more people were leaving than were coming in. And that has changed. So that has been the turning point. So when they left, we all said, well, welcome home. And then they're like, ah, <laughs> suburbs. And they cool, got out there <laughs> and they said, you know, it's not so great being in maybe the suburbs of New Jersey or in Greenwich. And there's Richard. Port, Richard's like, Florida. come on back. <laughs> so, you know, it's not like New York. You can't go yeah. out your door any time of day. Yeah. It can be two in the morning. It can be six in the morning. Uh, you can walk around the park. Your restaurants are open. There are people there. There's a vibrancy. There's There are people there. That's something you're either a city person or... Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. You're either a city person or you're not. Yeah. That's it. And that's really the bottom line. Exactly. I'm so sorry. Yeah, take it, take it. No, we're good. <laughs> okay, no problem. All right, that's a good place to, well, we're going to shift over here. We're going to talk a little bit about more you and your career. That was awesome, okay. by the way. Excellent. Okay, so you have had a long storybook career that keeps getting better and better. You have just made a big move from a uh, another company yes. to Compass. So let's talk about that. That was must have been a big decision for you, but we're so happy to have you with the Compass family. Obviously, you know Thank that. You. I'm sure we've everybody's probably bombarded you with emails and welcome. Uh, how have you? So first, let's talk about it. Let's. What was the kind of decision for yourself? I know I, I read your article in the Real Deal. It's an excellent article about kind of some of your thoughts on it. But I'd love to get it from you as to what was some of the sure. things for you and how's your experience been. Well, for 22 or 24 years, I was at uh, Warburg. It was a small boutique firm. Um, and then I decided because I have uh, a Florida license. About five years ago, I, I, I studied and I got a license in Florida because most of my clients were really, you know, back and forth. They were back and forth between New York, the Hamptons and Florida. And I thought this was silly. I was sending and giving a lot of referral business to people in Florida and the Hamptons. And I thought, it's crazy. I have to get a place in Florida. So I left Warburg after 22 years. And of the 22 years, I was the number one broker for 21 out of the 22 years. So I'm not proud of that one year. But um, <laughs> but um, but uh, uh, and so I went to Douglas Elliman, quite frankly, because they had offices all over 
uh, the areas where I had homes. I have a home in the Hamptons. I have a home in Florida. I actually have a small place in Aspen. And so I wanted a firm that had offices in all those four locations where I, I had friends and, and family. And I stayed at Douglas Elliman for about four or five years. And I have a son who um, I'm extremely proud of, who was one of the founders of BuzzFeed. Wow. And he then um, uh, parlayed that and be uh, founded a, a, a firm called, not a firm, a, a millennial television network called Cheddar TV. I don't yep. know if you've heard of that. I've heard of Cheddar TV. Okay. Yeah. And he said to me, Dad, um, Compass is the Google of real estate. Yeah. He said, and so you have to make a change. And he was the impetus that had me thinking because um, I thought about it. You know, um, everything in, in, in real estate now, as I'm sure you can appreciate, is time sensitive. What took three days to do now needs to be done in, in, in 20 minutes. The buyers now are much more savvy. They go on, they want to see numbers, they want to see platforms, they want to see uh, business, and they want to make their decisions in real time right. rather than saying, I'll get back to you in a day or two. So it's all about numbers, statistics, uh, pitch kits, <laughs> platforms, uh, giving your buyer or seller as much knowledge as you can in the least amount of time. And, and quite frankly, I've seen in my career that the buyer and seller has become um, less, how can I say this in the best possible way, less allegiant to their broker as they used to be. Yeah. And if they don't get the information that they want quickly, they're very happy to move on to another another broker. Right. And so for me, the impetus to leave was really about uh, the Compass platform and the availability of information and materials and the research that they do. I'll never forget when I met with Robert Redkin, he said most firms have, I think he said, 100 engineers to move the platform along. He said Compass has a thousand engineers to move it along. And that stuck with me. I always, and I just thought, you know what? Why not make the move? Why not make the move? We want, as brokers, you and I, we want to, we want as much um, material as we can right. to facilitate a deal as quickly as possible. Right. Right. So that's it. There was no backstory, as I said in the real deal. There was no drama. There was no backstory. There was no fight. I didn't. There wasn't quit. a backroom brawl wasn't fired. with the papers flying all over the place. <laughs> it wasn't anything. I just wanted to 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 avail myself with as much resources as necessary to get deals done. For someone like yourself um, who has sold throughout different times in real estate where technology has changed, you know, uh, you know, pre-internet, you know, having, you know, before the, uh, you know, Zillow's and Realtors and all this stuff. I mean, sure. people sometimes forget that there was real estate before Zillow and Realtor.com um, <laughs> yes. that did happen. So we used to write customers' names on note cards. Yeah, that shows you how old I am. You had a, you had the actual book. We had the actual of, written. We had the books with the note cards, and we had the files, and we had the rolodex. Yeah, the rolodex was great. Yeah, <laughs> and you'd rolodex. I mean, those days are gone, but um, for better or for worse, but they're gone. So your career, obviously, it's been a storied career. Where so if you had to kind of um, you know arch it a little bit, where you can kind of say, you know, from where it began, and you said you're a um, uh, Warburg went from the beginning when you started your I career? did. I started with, with Warburg. It was Ashforth Warburg at the time, and then it dropped the Ashforth, became Warburg. And that was really basically the only firm I was ever at. So for in the beginning of real estate, when you started, did you did you just have success right out of the gate? And it's been just nothing but all, you know, uh, sunshine and rainbows? Or was it a little different in the beginning and you had to build up your career and stuff? Well, it's I, I was very lucky. And, you know, so much of life whether it's in your personal life or your professional life, is really luck. Anyone that will tell you differently is not being totally um, uh, genuine or transparent. So the, my favorite story is I will have very good friends, and one of my friends, um, one of my close friends, was Isaac Perlman, the violinist. Mm. And um, when I went to real estate, he said, I'll, I'll be your first customer. He said, but because of my handicap, and you know, he had polo at, uh, polio as a child, you know, he, he uses crutches and sometimes a wheelchair. He said, if you can find a townhouse in New York City with an indoor swimming pool, I'll be your first customer. He was living in Babe Ruth's apartment at the time that he had bought. It was at 173 Riverside Drive. And, and um, I said, okay. And um, I went to my Rolodex and I went to all my files and everything. It was really, he said, and also I only want to live on the West Side because I want to be near Lincoln Center, of course. So there were three houses that had indoor swimming pools at the time on the west side within close proximity to Lincoln Center. 
And I took him out. I showed him three three houses in an hour, and he bought one of those. And at the time, I think it was about $3 million. It was the most expensive townhouse wow, back then. ever yeah. in New York City. Yeah. So what I'm trying to point out is I wasn't that good. I was just very, very lucky. And he was so happy that he introduced me to Leslie Stahl. And then he she introduced me to um, um, some baseball players. And, and so, yes, my career started very... Um, uh, very famously, because I just was very, very lucky. It's good to know people, right? When you when you know yeah. people that know people, it's very, very nice. It's, and, uh, um, so, what did you do? Were you oh, were real estate right out of school? Did you, it, is that? What I you actually did? was a doctor. I know oh, you okay. find that hard to believe. I Whoa, was a podiatrist. Hey. Okay. Yeah, I was a podiatrist. I did that. Um, I, I went to undergraduate. I got a degree in psychology, and then I went to medical school, Hahnemann, and um, I studied podiatry, and I was a foot and ankle surgeon for about 10 years. Wow. And I just got disillusioned. I love, I love surgery, and I just didn't like the day-to-day -day care. It wasn't energizing enough. It wasn't, uh, I never, I didn't feel the adrenaline rush as much as I, I wanted to. And I always loved architecture and I always bought and sold houses on the side. My wife and I bought and sold houses on the side and we would fix up a house and then sell it and then buy another one and renovate it. And so um, I just thought a segue, which was just to go into architecture, which wasn't an option because I didn't have a degree in architecture. Right. And I thought, well, you know what, I'll, I'll buy and sell real estate for other people rather than doing it for myself. So that's what happened. It, I didn't give it much thought. My children were in first and third grade, and I came home and told my wife one day, I said, you know, I'm changing professions, and um, we're going to move to New York. At the time, we were living in Short Hills, New Jersey, which is a suburb very similar to like Greenwich or Westport. Yeah, yeah. And I'll never forget, she said, I will support you. She said, I will give you one year to prove yourself. She said, and then I'm leaving you. And <laughs> I I'm knew there was going to be a catch to that. Yeah. You said, you one one year. Year. She said, you have one year to prove yourself. Yeah. Who leaves medicine and goes into real estate? She said, it's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. But I will support you for one year. And, um, you know, the, the end of the story is I'm married, you know, 48 years. I have two, two kids married. I have six grandchildren. Wow. And um, I'm still going strong. Well, I mean, I mean, you did that cold turkey. You just said, "Hey, you yeah. know what? I I think real estate's where I'm going to go." You didn't have you weren't dabbling in both. You, you didn't have your life. I did. That's any? actually that's actually a very good. That's a great question. Great question. Obviously, medicine was my was my revenue stream. It was my my it paid my bills. So yes, I I did try to do both, and then I realized when I was doing half and half, it just didn't work, and. Thank God I had enough savings. I thought, well, I'll survive for a couple of years. And um, and I just, I, I took the plunge and I did it. But I was lucky enough because the first month I went to real estate, I ended up selling that townhouse that I told you. I tell people, because I had a similar story. I was a teacher and uh, a swim coach and I did the same thing, uh, exactly the same thing. I have a, not exactly the same thing, but tried to. And I tell people when they're in the similar story and they ask me, you know, what do I do? I have this job and I kind of really feel like I want to do real estate. Sure. And I said, you know, one thing that's going to happen for me, and I want to know if it happened for you, is when I made the change and I knew that I was going to be focusing my energy and my passion and I felt a weird sense of confidence, even though complete freedom in real estate means to go all the way up or go all the way down. I felt the, the sense of confidence that I could do it, but it was a relief. It was almost like this is what I'm doing now and I'm happy yeah. and I'm passionate. Did you feel that way? Um, I sort of always know that I'm going to land on my feet somehow, some way. So, yeah, I mean, I did make the plunge. I didn't really give it much thought. When I think back now, I actually, the thought of it now seems so much challenging and, and worse and scary than it was at the time. But I was younger at the time. You know, I didn't really think about it too much. I just thought I'll land on my feet. I'll work. And I honestly thought I could always go back to medicine. The nice thing. And I kept my license for a couple oh, of years. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I took I, continuing education courses. I made sure my license was active, and and I did think, well, you know, I can always go back to medicine. Yeah, you got you get you know you got your wife around for a year to make sure it works, and then <laughs> if it doesn't, does you know, excellent, excellent. Yeah. That's a great story. And obviously, look, it has worked out. And obviously, you know, whether even even if you got lucky with that first one, obviously, you're very good at what you do to be able to have created a whole career out of it to be able to do what you've been able to do and yeah. network and everything. So uh, over the oh, course, sure. 
Yeah, sorry. You know, so much, as I said, and I just can't emphasize this enough because I don't want, uh, you know, young people going into the business to be discouraged. And, you know, so much of it is luck. I mean, you, you can be good. Look, I believe everyone in life is a salesman. You just sell something different. It's a different product. It, you have to convince you either have that selling gene or you don't have that selling gene. Right. I mean, when I was doing surgeries, obviously um, people needed the, the the patients needed the care, but they could have gone to men, more doctors than myself. They could have gotten second and third opinions. And for the most part, they would come back to me and I would administer their care. But you would have to sell them your confidence. They would have to trust you. Isn't that selling in some form? Yeah. Um, whether you're on Wall Street, whether you are um, have your own company. I mean, when you really get down to it, isn't every occupation some form of sales. Yeah, everything in life is a sale. You're either being sold or you're selling in one form or another. Uh, I think that we, especially what I like about Compass and even getting to speak to someone like you, yeah, we are consultants. You can call us salespeople, whatever you like to do it. But to have a storied career like yourself, there's a way in which we do what we do and that you do what you do that obviously is of the highest level. We're not car salesmen here selling used cars and pushing right. product on people. We know what people you know, I had a, we don't, you know. I had a I had a grandmother who used to say something and, and, and if you know you didn't ask for advice, but maybe your your listeners need advice. Sure. She used to say, if you always tell the truth and you're always transparent she didn't use the word transparent of course, but she said if you always tell the truth, you never have to remember the story. Oh that's true. So, so that I, and I, if you say, what are the, some of the characteristics I've always prided myself for good or for bad, and I've lost some exclusives and I lo I have lost some buyers. If you always just be tr honest and genuine and tell the truth, then mo for the most part, it works through yeah. and you never have to remember, you never have to try to, you know, be a used car salesman and, and mislead people or, right. or, or not be you know, honest or truthful, just yeah. tell the truth. And you're going to have such a successful long career. You don't why, why jeopardize anything and ever give up who you are or ever put any of that right. on the line. Just, yeah, exactly. I mean, we're lucky enough, our team that we're now working on the second generation, the people that we bought and sold apartments to their kids are married now. And now they're calling us yeah. to sell them, you know, houses and, and yeah. apartments and everything. And that's very gratifying. Yeah. That's really rewarding when you get the second generation. Yeah. So this real estate boom that we've had now in, in this part of your career where there's been, I mean, real estate with the with the, the blowing up of million dollar listing and all the different shows and everything. So, and I know you were on the uh, Selling New York. Um, right. So being on those different shows and, and this expansion of real estate on TV and coming be a sexy thing again. Um, how are you, are you using that to kind of stand out uh, or what are you doing these days for marketing? I mean, anything different? Well, first of all, we got canceled after okay. four years. Okay. But hey, listen, <laughs> we you had canceled run after four years. It's very hard to compete with a show like Million Dollar Listings. It really is because yeah. so much of that show, and and I, this is a compliment to the to the people who are in it, um, uh, are comfortable revealing their personal life. It's something that I wasn't comfortable doing oh. on television. Yeah. And I I was really very. Uh, specific about a separation. So I don't use that as marketing. That's the point I'm using. What I have been trying to do lately, and that's uh, so much of it is because of my son, is I've been trying to go to other outlets for marketing. And right now, I find that, um, you know, your your Instagram, your Facebook, your social media is so important. Your visual tours on these sites is so important because right. now when you, you get requests and we're getting uh, buyers, it's almost like by the time they call us and say, we want to see this property, it's almost like their second visit. They've already done a 3D tour. They've done a video tour on our site. We use Mattersport quite a bit, yep, Matterport. you know, and and and. So much of it is it's almost like a second showing now because the tools that we have now, we didn't have 15 years ago. So you can view an apartment. You can see if you like it already before you even call the broker. Yeah. And that's quite a, that's 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 been remarkable. Yeah. It's changed the, the nature of our business dramatically. Yeah. I think it's it's also important for people listening to know that um, you have a lot of clients at the elite level, a high end level, like you said, politicians, celebrities and different <laughs> things like that. Um, the client care that you have to be ingrained with them to stay in the longevity of your life to, you know, to make sure that their second, third home, generational homes are all bought with Richard Steinberg. Um, anything that you do to, to stay top of mind with your clients, anything like that over the course of the years? Because you are going to be with them for a lifetime a lot of times. Right. We, uh, we've sort of been lucky. Um, 
uh, I would say 95% of our business now we've, we've curated has is really from uh, either past people that we've worked with or f- from referral business. Right. Um, and also, um, my clients are my friends. My friends are my clients, if that makes sense to you. Um, my friends know that, you know, there are two ways that you can go when you deal with friends. They can say, well, I want to work with you because I trust you. And I know that you're, you're going to be finding, you're going to be working in the best interest of my, of my goals. Right. Or they can say, you know, it's not a good idea to work with friends. I take the position, my friends know that if they don't work with me, quite frankly, it will affect the friendship. It will. And that's not a threat. I don't mean that as, as in a threatening way. It's just that I couldn't in all conscience. I was I was out to dinner last night and it was a, a friend of mine. And, you know, we haven't seen each other for a while. And um, I sold his daughter an apartment and I sold him an apartment. And now he said to me, oh, you're going to be so excited. My, my son got a great apartment. My son just bought a great apartment. And I must yeah, have I, looked a little bit surprised. Yeah. And he said, oh, he said, oh, oh, oh. He said, no, 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 no. He bought it from the developer. We wanted to save the commission. Well, I almost can understand that. He thought he was getting the, you know, the developer would negotiate less. He didn't have to pay the commission for the broker. But if he would have said, oh, my son worked with another broker, I could not have looked at him in the same way. It really would have, I would have taken it personally. Yeah. I do take it personally, quite yeah. frankly. Yeah. My friends don't work with me. I take it personally. Yeah. It's hard. It, it's one of those things where you have to kind of be in our field to understand that. You know, it's, yeah. no matter what we say, you know, if you see somebody on social media and they bought a house and you're like, hmm, well, you just, yeah. you know, we just talked. It, does, it, go, it just comes <laughs> right through me. Yeah, it goes so right weird. through me. I, yeah. and I'm, I'm much older than you and I'm, I'm really, you know, I, I should be much more hardened. I should have a tougher skin. No, but you know what that makes you, you, you don't give that up. I, I don't want to give that up. I, 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 people say that to me all the yeah. time about it, leaving the heart on the sleeve and you got to look at a little bit more business or it. Yes. But, but then if I lost that part of me, I don't know if I would be the same. Yeah. Passionate. You know? If one of my closest friends bought an apartment without me, or a townhouse without me, I, I couldn't be friends with them. Yeah. I know that's a really tough thing to say, and I, I'm being totally honest with you. It really would just affect me. I, I don't know that I could I could go out with them and, and have a glass of wine with them. And, you know, every time I would look at them, I'd be seeing the picture of the house that they didn't buy through <laughs> me. Well, listen, I'm sure you have a lot of friends that are going to continue to buy a lot of real estate. Yeah. You're going to be just so. okay. <laughs> um, I, I, wanted, so. I wanted to ask you about... Um, some current real estate stuff that you're working on. I love okay. 33 East 74th Street. Tell me a little bit about that. That is actually, it's a great town. It's a 35 foot wide, 31 foot wide townhouse in New York City. And I must tell you that in New York City, everything is predicated on the width of the house. So um, a, really a 20 foot wide house is really the dividing line between what someone considers almost like a mansion and just a regular house. So that's really a 20 footer is the dividing line. And this is 31 feet wide. It is part of actually um, a complex that was built that is, adjoins seven condominium units. So what's unique about this is you have your own standalone house, but you have the amenities of your doorman, your concierge, your your support staff, your porters, your maintenance, your upkeep, your backyard upkeep, your your front upkeep. So it's quite unusual. It's really beautiful. It was built in, I think, 1901. It's called the Atterbury Mansion. And it was built for a general Atterbury. And so it's quite unique. The living room itself is probably 50 by 30 with 14 foot ceilings. With 14 foot ceilings and um, um, or maybe 16 foot ceiling. So it, it's a spectacular place. It was completely gut renovated. I sold it to actually a Russian gentleman who lived in London and decided not to move um, from London to the United States. So he stayed in London. Oh, okay. So he ended up not actually living in and it. He never lived in it. And we just, um, so we put it back on the market. Excellent. Excellent. And I wish you all the best in that. That was absolutely beautiful apartment. It is beautiful. And it's quite spectacular. Excellent. Quite and spectacular. Uh, wish you the best on that. Um, we, I, I want to keep asking you a lot of questions and take up a lot more of your time, but I know you're very, very busy. Uh, and uh, my house, my, my guys are literally working on so many things. I don't want them to I understand. any more noise. I understand. Um, is there anything that we didn't talk about that you wanted to talk about? Because I could keep going for hours. But- no, no. The only thing, we'll just, if you want me really to sum up, I love what I do. Anyone that goes into the business, 
you know, I'm, I, they should be so proud of themselves because I don't think that people understand how hard our business is. I think that they see someone will do a $5 million deal or a $10 million deal and they'll multiply that by, um, by the 2% or 3% and think, oh my God, they're getting a fat check for $150,000. They don't take into account the 30 people you and I have taken out for two years who decided that they're not going to buy or maybe have bought with some another broker because they're working with more than one broker. I tell everyone the business is absolutely the best business you can be in, but you really have to take rejection. You have to be good at that yeah. because 10%, 20%, I don't know what the numbers are, of our deals come to fruition and we make the money. Before that, we lose so many deals. So what I would say to your your listeners is it's not as easy as it looks. No, this is not a business for the uh, weak-minded or the people who give up easily. You cannot, you will not make it. And that's why 86 to 90% of all real estate agents quit the business after a year because no, really, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's, it's, this, this, it's a big stat and it's actually compounded now because real estate is since real estate's hot, everybody wanted to get their license and it keeps going and right. going and going. And they don't realize that it doesn't work that way. It's it's not- We make no money. We, we're, we're independent contractors who work 100% on commission. Right. And there can be months that go on without getting paid a dime. Yeah. So, and I tell new people coming into the business, you need to have a stockpile. You have to have enough money to last a year without making a deal. Right. Or at least to, sub, to subsidize. Yep what you make in commission because it's just not that easy. And keep the pipeline full because although you can be happy about a closing, you do have a lot of other clients you have to serve and new clients you need to meet. Yeah. You're only as good as your last deal. That's right. You're only as good as your last Absolute. deal. Absolutely. Richard, where can people find you? Website, Instagram, social media handles, things like that. Um, well, we can go. they can go on the Steinberg team at Compass Real Estate. Mm -hmm. uh, my email is very easy. It's just rsteinberg at compass.com. They can Google us. We have enough articles and newspaper about us. And um, that's it. I, you know, I use my cell phone and that's it. So it's really the Steinberg team at compass.com. Do you have an Instagram handle? A what? An Instagram, Instagram handle? handle. Um, Steinberg team. Um, Steinberg team. Okay. Is our Instagram Steinberg handle. team. Yep. Okay. Excellent. And we'll put all the, um, all the tags and everything like that and all the links on the bottom for the YouTube and everything. That'd like be that. great. And everything. That'd be great. So, uh, Richard, thank you so much for being on with us again. I'd love to have you back on another time. And uh, yeah, it was great talking to you anytime. Just let me know. Absolute pleasure. And ladies and gentlemen, until next time, Michael Farrow, Leaders of Lifestyle Podcast. Take care. <laughs>